Today we have an early flight to Stockholm, Sweden. As our host, we have a true legend from the Swedish entrepreneurial circles, Niklas Nick Carlsson, the founder and CEO of Founders Alliance and the Entrepreneurs World Summit. Prior to the event, Nick has arranged us a unique chance to meet up and chat with a suite of international entrepreneurs sharing a global perspective on the developments of the entrepreneurial world. Founders Alliance is a collaborative, collaborative forum between large-scale founders, grown-ups. Uh, today um, it is uh, about 600 entrepreneurs, founding entrepreneurs, first-generation founders entrepreneurs that have created a mid- or large-sized company in the past or today. They own about 3,000 growth companies because what they also love is other startups. So they help them as investors, board members, mentors. And they also uh, inject value to society. Core is the tax income from their activities, but also their services is about uh, changing something within the social side or the commercial side for people. But they're also engaged as philo philanthropy. So what our mission in Founders Alliance is very simple. We try to attract, uh, find their challenge number one on their whole 360 level as an entrepreneur and trying to add value to that. Even if it's them personally, their family fora, ownership fora, leadership fora, in whatever company they have or social project. And that value is uh, mostly delivered by exchange with other peers or key relationships. Now we are in Stockholm to enjoy um, the Entrepreneurs World Summit. Yeah. What, what is that all about? The greater thing is that uh, entrepreneurs, just like we have done in Sweden, we found for six years ago that this is a very small market and the big challenges are internationalization. So we started to do the same on a global level. So now we have been in contact with uh, 250 non-Swedish entrepreneurs as well. However, they need to meet and therefore we have as one activity the Entrepreneurs World Summit where we channel all those that have a calendar. So this is uh, not an event where uh, people are speakers. There's not an event where people get to sponsor to, to try to find customers. It's an event only for these uh, entrepreneurs to work around their challenges and build trust. Entrepreneurs um, uh, build the world as one element. They do that not alone, they do that together with the other parts of the society, together with the fantastic... Uh, entrepreneurs wouldn't exist without employees. They build the world. Founders Alliance build those entrepreneurs, and I build the Founders Alliance. So if I make sure that it's a highly impact, efficient, happy, good operation that really every second delivers value through that operation to these entrepreneurs, that will make a difference on a bigger scale, you know, uh, what will change the world. Because these entrepreneurs, they go first. They are the leaders that makes things happen. So you've seen quite a lot of different types of uh, founders and entrepreneurs. What, what would you say would be characteristics of a good entrepreneurial yeah. leader? Uh, driven by creation is a definite uh, common denominator. Almost the obsessedness of making sure that uh, something that is painful within the market, the industry or in the society is getting changed through services and new products. Uh, some call it innovation, but I call it more the obsessedness of creation. And make sure and want to, wanting to see that uh, being built to something large. That's an attitude, psychological attitude. And being humble in that, that if you have a, such a big uh, vision, you know that the, even if you're highly cap capable, you will never succeed alone. So you need a very highly collaborative uh, mentality. That is also a key success factor of many of these entrepreneurs, that they, they often honor others rather than themselves. Mm. Because they know that that creates driving forces. They're almost happy that people are joining them. So they're not alone with that big dream. So they get crazy. So uh, if we go forward, uh, we will have uh, four entrepreneurs giving a global perspective, yeah. which is suitable here from Stockholm on different continents from North America, Europe and Asia, sharing their uh, experiences as part of this Entrepreneurs World Summit. 
2019. Uh, right now I have created an artificial midwife. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's basically the Swedish maternal care system um, comprised in an app. So you can follow your own health during your pregnancy. China is our biggest market because the Chinese version was the first one we launched. So China is actually the only mar- only market where we have done marketing. Uh, so uh, when I got this idea, I moved to China and I took my two kids and I went there and I started the business. So China was our very first market because when I looked at the globe, I, imedi- I mean, I wanted to have a global business. I wanted to be able to reach out to as many women as possible. And in China, there are 22 million pregnant women a year. So that gives you 100 million pregnant women over five years. So currently I'm the CEO of a company called Animoca Brands. Uh, We're listed in Australia and headquartered in Hong Kong. Um, It's a mobile game company um, focused on smartphone and and tablet games. Um, So like many companies from Finland that are very well known around the world. Um, We make casual games, mid-core games, we make some educational games, um, and we distribute those on the platforms built by Google and Apple uh, around the world. From the very first day, we've been a global business because for us to publish our games in the App Store with Apple or Google, um, there's really no difference publishing to our local market or a global audience. And one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons we got into this business and we're, I think, particularly adept at addressing a global audience is because Hong Kong is a very small place. You know, we're a city of 7 million people. The local market has its limitations. Um, We actually focus on a particular niche, which is branded gaming, which is why it's called Animoca Brands. So we license brands from third parties. So anime and manga companies and entertainment television companies. And then we use those licensed brands in our games. So brands like Garfield and Doraemon and Astro Boy and Ultraman, etc. And we make original games featuring those brands. Um, so this is very much a sort of cross-border partnership because often the brands we work with come from the US or Europe or Japan. Um, and then we evangelize those brands through our games. So Tries has a cloud solution for medical imaging. So clinics and hospitals around the world use our system to store their medical data and in an easy way, directly from the machines, replace CDs and printouts so that you can send something for second opinion anywhere in the world. Or you could replace the CD or printout for you as a patient. Mm -hmm. And they can store the images long term and they can also do their medical reports. Today, we're launched in around 40 countries around the world, and we have global partnership with some of the really big vendors of these imaging devices like GE, Samsung, Sonosite. And we actually are a little bit like Intel inside's brand. Uh, we, our system is called Tricify inside, so we're actually built inside all of General Electric's ultrasound devices globally. I see myself, as I would say, more as an adventurer than as a businessman. I have a company called Business Bum, uh, also, and and that is when when you do business for uh, when you do business for travel, you don't travel to do business, kind of speak, uh, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, I, I I tend to try to do business in interesting countries. Today, my main business, you, you could say, is I, I have a couple of different things that I'm working with. Uh, uh, one is stone, tombstones, where I have a tombstone factory in China uh, providing to the Scandinavian market. We are the, uh, and then also one in Estonia. Uh, to do tombstones, we do, it, we do everything right all the way to, to placing the stones. I have about 20-25% of the Swedish market. Uh, then I'm also working with in uh, um, Northern Africa in, um, by Adener, or, uh, in, in Swedish, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Somaliland, which is the north region of, of Somalia, uh, uh, working together with the government there for fishing rights to sell to, 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 to try to legalize the fishing and, and make it sustainable. And, and then uh, I have, I mean, involved in a company that is called ASR that is working with fishing rights for, by the African coast. And also then I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in quarries. Uh, running a, a quarry in Africa, and uh, and then I'm also involved in a company working in bringing in companies to China, helping uh, introductions into China, 
uh, mostly actually within clean tech, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in environmental in the environmental areas or, or energy saving areas and, and, and so on. And then also buy companies in Scandinavia with the Chinese buyers within the clean tech area. That's what I'm working with right now. From your perspective, what do you see as hotspots for uh, building up companies nowadays? I think I see two trends towards hotspots for entrepreneurs um, and they come from very different ends of the spectrum. On the one hand, I think you see a tremendous amount of entrepreneurialism in places where people lack opportunity. So they lack access to capital, goods, etc. And for that, I mean um, definitely less developed countries. So you see tremendous entrepreneurialism in places like China, where I come from, places like um, Africa and the Middle East, um, Latin America, where there are, you know, less people there are less opportunities for people, so people motivate themselves and create their own opportunities. And entrepreneurialism comes from that. The other end of the spectrum is entrepreneurialism driven by capital, meaning there is capital willing to fund ideas, so people generate ideas because there's money available and resources available to create those products. So I think Silicon Valley has been, particularly for technology and healthcare, um, the home of entrepreneurialism for so long because there is that nexus of capital and entrepreneurs. But I think the capital is the chicken that comes before the egg. There's a lot of interesting things happening in Asia and they are like way ahead of us on so many, many things when it comes to digital. And it kind of scares me how ignorant we are in the Western world about what's happening there. Mm and how we are using digital tools here that is not really helping us. It, it slows us down, but we think it's useful and helpful. But if we look at the digital tools that they have, that is so much more efficient and how everyone works more efficient by using them. Mm. Um, so I think China and Asia um, is coming strongly. If I say China, I mean uh, maybe that. I mean I've, I've lived in China for maybe ten years, and and I've seen the whole development from, from like dirt floor to poor as hell, uh, to to uh, rich, 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 right? Uh, where everything is is perfect. I mean today when you come back to Sweden, it feels like you're coming to, nothing bad about Romania, but uh, if you would say uh, as comparing between Sweden and Romania, maybe it feels a lot richer and a lot more developed and a lot faster and better in so many ways in in China these days. And I, I would never believe even 10 years ago that I would say it, but now they have bypassed us, hmm. in my view. Uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship in, in China, there's a totally different thing because uh, if you have the ability to run your own business, you should run your own business. If you don't, you're stupid. Hmm. Uh, uh, also because uh, almost everyone have, someone has made millions on their street who was a farmer before or like really poor. So everybody believes it's possible. Uh, if, if you, uh, it, it's not at all to say that you come from, from making, let's say 500 kroner a month to making 100 million a year is nothing strange because everybody knows someone who has, has done it. So they are aiming for it. Also, it's a totally different kind of, of entrepreneurs that survives because they are, they are acting in a market where, where it has gone up all the time. So the, the biggest winners are the biggest risk takers, like period. Hmm. Uh, the more risk you have taken, the richer you are. I mean, you have, if you go for the billionaires in China today, they are the biggest risk taker you would ever, they wouldn't have survived three, four years in, in this market. If if you are, are young and and test and 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 you need to take risks to actually get somewhere, you should go to somewhere where where you are the only uh, where you are the only Westerner. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you you're nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it feels comfortable, it it's it's uh, as an entrepreneur that I would say. But as an entrepreneur, now I wouldn't go to China. I would go to Africa. But yes. that that's a different thing. Right? Maybe you could share a few of your experience about Africa and the entrepreneurial seen there and the uh, opportunities arising in Africa? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I recognize it's quite a lot from China in the 90s. I mean, e even though Somaliland, uh, as, I mean, that is North Somalia, where I'm doing business now, is, is considered one of the poorest countries, like lowest three in the world or something like that. It's still richer than China was in the 90s. 
uh, it feels richer. I mean, it, in, in China, if someone had a moped or a motorcycle, I mean, they, they, that was like the hot, the, the shit, right? And I mean, it, it's, they, they still have cars like, uh, uh, and, and so on. And, and it's, it's quite uh, established. I think that... Um, I think that Africa will come now very, very strongly. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, they don't have the culture of, uh, of like, like the Chinese, uh, of uh, aiming for money and aiming for, for corporate and, and, and all of this. But, uh, but they, they have massive amounts of, of uh, they have a lot of raw material. They also have, I mean, if you would say, because of the wars that has been, a lot of, of, of people from Africa has, has gone to Europe, has, has gone to all over the world, right? And now they're coming back with a lot of connections, with, with a, a big understanding, even bigger understanding than many Chinese, right? About how it works in different countries. So if they're, if they're able to utilize that in a good way, I think it will go... Uh, I think it will go. Uh, it will go very well. I mean, what I've seen so far of Africa, I'm, I'm, I'm positively, I'm very positive uh, towards it. But then, of course, I, I've, I've only been there a couple of times, mm -hmm. while in in China I've been for ten years and you, you um, or, or twenty years almost, and and it's it's um, first impression is not always the correct one, right? So we will see. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a year I would say, oh fuck, I would never go there. Would you have some small um, uh, snippets of wisdom or recommendations for the ones that are just heading out for their careers? You're able, as an entrepreneur, you're able to create exactly the life you want. If you just kind of let go of everything that people say that a workplace is supposed to look like and how you're supposed to work, you can just, you can create that by yourself. It's kind of as, as an entrepreneur, you're able to completely invent a game where you set the rules, you set the rewards, you set the end game, the purpose, and you recruit the players who all play your game. Mm. And I think that's fantastic. If I talk to other leaders or managers, I've never had the same issues that they have. And that's because... I get to choose the players entirely by myself. You have to have a lot of drive. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a very strong stomach. Um, and you do have to be willing to make a lot of sacrifices. I think the thing about being an entrepreneur that's most difficult is that um, we glamorize a lot of the success stories. Mm -hmm. But being an entrepreneur in technology is no different from being an entrepreneur in opening a restaurant. Most of the businesses fail. And some of them start out as vanity projects or passion projects. But unless you're willing to put in the, the long hours in through all the tough times and believe in the, your vision, um, it's going to be a very, very difficult road. Have courage to follow your dream. Make sure you have really, really good mentors uh, that can help you and guide you that actually are former entrepreneurs. Make sure you go out there and knock on every door. Don't uh, sit down and try to create uh, your product and integrate your product. Get out there, try it out. Uh, because it's out there with the customer, you actually get to get the real stuff and the, the real feedback. It's important that you get out there really, really fast and uh, that you try out your product with the customers. Uh, don't listen to people, just do your own thing. And, and, uh, uh, and if you really believe that it's, it's possible, just go for it. Because you, you will have no new ideas ever where people will agree that it's a good idea. Because it's like in the nature of it, mm -hmm. right? Maybe then if you, need, if, you want to have, if you want to talk to people, then talk to other entrepreneurs. People have started their own business before. Because if you talk to no matter how high up they are, it can be the vice president of, of a huge corporation or, or even president. Uh, they will not understand why you would even want to start something new. What, what's the interest with it? Why do it? It's not so dangerous to try out because if you have, often in the Nordic countries and Europe, you have a funding as a student. And uh, why don't you try, try out when you have a funding and when you don't, uh, don't take costs, uh, save... Um, Save as much cost as you can. That is something that is very important later on because you need to bootstrap and uh, call customers and uh, being very open and honest with them. 
you can start calling whatever person and asking them for advice. And eventually that's the best way of selling. Mm -hmm. No company will be created without customers and the input of them. And you, you should be uh, finding that most, many people, when you're so open, are very happy to contribute. If you're an entrepreneur with uh, something, you need to spend a lot of time. Better do that with something you're passionate about.